All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, joining our first episode. I'm thrilled to have uh, Maureen today joining us for this uh, little experiment of ours. Uh, thank you very much for, having it, for, for being with us, uh, Maureen. My pleasure. I'm very excited. The idea behind it is that we should be discussing the intersection uh, between design and code uh, with a bit of focus on open source and open standards. So it's not actually focused on Penpot per se, right? Uh, although, of course, Penpot does touch um, upon all those uh, three subjects. But this is more about the industry, uh, teams, you know, workflows, and things that we value. Um, then we can sometimes uh, discuss something about Penpot or not, or perhaps even all the tools. That's fine, absolutely fine. But we are very interested in the dynamics within teams around those subjects. Uh, intersection between design code and then, of course, how not um, open source and open standards, which we think are, are key to, to, those, to those interactions. So uh, first of all, uh, Maureen, could you please introduce yourself, just a, um, a few words so people can know you and know where you, you're at? Sure, so my name is Maureen Duffy. Um, I'm a New Yorker living in Boston. I moved to Boston to work at Red Hat. Um, I started at Red Hat in 2004. So I've been there for quite some time. And um, I'm basically a, a UX designer that works on open source software. Um, sorry about that. Let me just put on, do not disturb. Okay. Anyway, I, I am a UX designer who works on open source software. And it honestly, since I was in high school and I started playing around with Linux, you know, in the early days, like the late 90s, it, it didn't look great. We'll say that. Um, so I thought, well, hey, if I study computer science and design, maybe I can help make it better. So I'm one of those weird cases where I kind of knew what I wanted to do and I've been doing it for a long time. Wow. So uh, so late 90s. Uh, so I can relate to that, definitely. Um, and you could you share perhaps one of your first uh, Linux distros or the one that uh, hooked you into the uh, just the whole Linux, uh, GNU Linux uh, world, which was that one back then, late 90s. Yeah, well, it's a weird story. Um, I was a teenage girl. I used the telephone a lot, you know, those days when we only had one phone line. And my brother was a computer science student, and he needed to access Telnet to get to his university to compile his yeah. homework. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I was on the phone all the time, so he never had access so he ended up bringing home a copy. It was Red Hat Linux 5.1, I think, the Manhattan release, because he needed a compiler <laughs> because I kept <laughs> home line busy. So yeah, um, we actually, and we got PPP working too, and that was very difficult in those days. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it was Red Hat Linux. Although when I went on to college, um, I, I did Slackware and Debian, and I was a long time Debian user until I came to Red Hat. And then obviously I use Fedora now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, very cool, very cool. Okay, so um, we we want to keep uh, these these podcasts uh, rather specular in nature, which uh, it means that I we have some questions uh, that we'd like to ask you, but also uh, we know you have some other questions that you would like to throw at us. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, just you know um, one and then one, two, two, three, three, something like that and see how it feels. I will ask the audience, uh, you know, if they, they like that format. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be more like, uh, quite, it will be like more traditional interview. And I think we, we want to uh, uh, break them all here. So um, let's start with um, a one that is actually quite relevant, I think, in your uh, workplace, which is all about the uh, these professional boundaries between design and code. Uh, we, we feel at, at Penpot that those boundaries are blurring. Are fading away uh, more often than not it's about the activity and not the role itself like whether you're doing design activity or a designer you know what's or code activity or a coder and i uh, would like in your case what's your opinion about that your, and how do you see that perhaps particularly in your in your team if that is already happening or if it's a bigger trend uh, your your thoughts on that so I have an interesting opinion on that that might be contradictory to what you guys are thinking. Um, okay. So I study computer science and design at school um, and I ended up doing a dual degree and I tried to do both. So like it was a four by four program. So it was four classes, four credits and you had to do 16 credits a semester. So I did, I tried to do 
two classes for computer science, two classes for design every semester. I was exhausted. I wasn't producing great work. I was felt lost. So what I ended up doing is I would do a whole semester of computer science and then a whole semester of design. And I got way more out of the program. I felt like I was doing a lot better work. So I, I have this personal experience thinking that I, I think it's good that designers approach towards code. And I think yeah. it's good that that developers approach design, but I don't think, you know, in the same way that you shouldn't QA your own code, I don't think okay. you should design your own code. I think there needs to be a separation because it's sort of like the reason you separate, say, I don't know, an interior designer from a structural engineer when building a building. The interior designer really wants that massive window and it looks big and beautiful and makes them look good. But the, the structural engineer knows that there's no way the building can support that. So you, you you need two people, I think, one person thinking about how is this going to be built and maintained? And then you need the other person to think, how can this make the best user experience? I don't think that can live in one brain or else I'm just limited. And it, it can't both live in my brain at once. No, I mean, that makes a ton of sense. Um, the, the, there are many ways those boundaries could be, would feel blurry now. One is that, one person can do multiple things. Like, uh, the other is that two people can actually interact with a better understanding of what the other uh, is doing. Uh, probably that's more the idea that we are looking at here, uh, because if you, 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 if you went to the, uh, the first approach, which is I can do both, you would probably be inclined to use tools that give you a bit of superpowers. Like I'm this solo player and I need extra cap capacity to feel like I can do more. I can do more with uh, this extra tooling, right? And there is a ton of market options for that, like just tools that extend your very limited capability. Here is more about high performance teams. And I think we are approaching this, at least from our perspective is more, uh, no, you, you actually are focused on design or whether it's ux ui or any other interaction of visual design or you are into the code but that doesn't mean that you have separate complete separate understandings of of that subject like you have an ongoing conversation you don't there's no lost in translation you have this empathy uh with uh, the other people and that is that is where we see the the, the boundaries are uh, fading away a bit yeah, it's more it I, I definitely see that trend. It's less throwing it over the wall. But it, it also I mean, it really depends on how organizations are structured. Like I prefer working in a team like embedded in the development team. So like my coworkers and my peers are the developers. So like the designers and developers are all one team. But, you know, some organizations are tooled too, where like the designers are on the design team and the developers are on the product team and the designers almost consult out. So it's like even just the structure of the organization sometimes puts a wall up that I don't think should necessarily be there. And there's ways around it, but absolutely having tooling like Penpot where we can just put together design and the developers can log in and check our progress easily and leave comments for us. It, it helps pull that wall down where there might be, say, an organizational wall in, in its place, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think we, we will go into a bit more detail Um on how exactly you you work, you know how you work within within Red Hat Fedora uh, at that level, uh, because you mentioned like it depends on the organization. Well, you you have one or two organizations you can you can talk about. Then we're very interested in knowing about that. Um, so the second question would be related to actually your workflow, like at Red Hat uh, or Fedora. Exactly how how you are looking at that relationship between design and code, designers and coders. I uh, would love to know more about how you operate that. And if there is anything that you want to change that you're looking uh, forward to changing, that will be also be interesting to hear, or perhaps anything that uh, changed very recently and you are benefiting from that already. Sure, so um, let me think. So there's a couple of projects that I have going on right now that are primarily managed through Penpot. The first one is the Fedora website redesign. And the second one is a new um, desktop tool called Podman Desktop, which is kind of like Docker Desktop, but for Podman. Yeah, um, so the way that we're managing those, there are some little niggles, which are fine. They, we work through them. So it, there are interesting contrasts, though, because the Fedora website one is a primarily a Fedora project in the open upstream community. 
and Podman Desktop is an upstream public, but the team that I work with is a Red Hat team. It's not a community-based team. So okay. it's like a little bit of a different flavor. Um, but basically what, what we have going on right now is it's me and like a team of designers on each project. And we go in, we manage, um, I'm trying to think of how we have it. With Podman Desktop, there was some pre-existing screens that we were working with that the developers had put together themselves before having any design engagement. So one of the things that we started with was sort of a, I would call it like a heuristic evaluation of what was there to think about mm -hmm. what are some quick wins. Cause they, they had like a presentation they had to give and they wanted it to be its best in the time we had allotted. So we d basically did like a screen survey. So we took screenshots of every single little screen and dialogue and we made, um, I think, I might have the terms wrong for pen pot. I just see them and I don't think about the words, but there's like pages. And then within each page, there's like a canvas or a board. board. A board is probably yeah. the right. Yeah. So we had a page that was just for screenshots for the heuristic evaluation. Each screenshot had its own board. And then we kind of marked up the boards with comments using the comment feature, like maybe do this or that. And we kind of did reviews back and forth. And then when we started redesigning them, we, we kind of, prioritized and picked because we couldn't redesign everything. So we picked like a few areas, like five different areas. Let's take these screens or these flows and just put together sort of how we'd like it to look as designers. And then there's like a negotiation that comes after that. So we did a page per one of each of the five designs that we were going to do. And um, we just put them together. We use the, the prototype feature where you can click through, which yeah, has been yeah. a huge boon. A, a number of years ago, me and Garrett Lesage wrote like a JavaScript extension to Inkscape to do something like that. And we had horrible cool. performance issues, but yeah, that was something we had like 10 years ago. So having it so performant and nice and easily managed in PenPod is awesome because there's really something that's lost when you're just working with 2D static mockups, like it doesn't convey as well. Yeah. Anyway, so we we went through, me and um, my teammate went through when we came up with like each of the five pages, the, the mock-ups. And then, so the new feature came out in PenPot during this process, which was that people could log in. They didn't have to have a login to leave comments, which is very helpful because we could yeah. just post the mock-ups to the community and our community board, not have to create accounts for everybody and they could leave comments. But at the time that this sort of transition happened in the middle of the project, but. Can I, can um, I just very quick, I think um, whether it was you or someone from the team, or perhaps I'm, I wanted to uh, just name drop here anyone, but, uh, or someone from Inkscape perhaps, it was someone on the community that was asking for this anonymous um, comment option, like okay. not need, no need to log in, no need, you know, just give me the link. I can go there and I can comment. Um, and we said, okay, yeah, that makes sense for a workflow where you have want to have zero friction for people that are not yet onboarded, right? Um, so that was not that that happened a few months ago. Uh, so you you are already enjoying that. I'm I'm super glad to hear. Yeah, it's so helpful just to be able to even because you know we do rounds with ourselves like you know before like I try to make everything as public as possible as soon as possible, but sometimes it's like. I don't want to put a mock-up out there that makes a promise that the developers say we can't keep, if that makes sense. So I like giving them a first look first before it goes out public. But it's so handy to be able to just throw a link out there and be like, hey, what do you think to the actual users? And they can leave comments and not, you know, I, I would never even intend for them to have accounts on the system. It's just nice to get their comments and to get them in line. They can drag exactly on the thing because I'm used to years of doing blog posts where I have static mockups in the blog post and then the comments and you know how comments get on the internet, yeah. but the comments talking about things that I don't even know what they're referring to. Right. So it's just, it's handy to have that. But um, it was the, by the way, it was the blender community that asked for that because okay. they had okay. to have feedback from users slash animators mm -hmm. slash developers. They wanted to post those uh, designs, those interactive mockups for the redesign of the UI and have like anonymous feedback, which was valuable enough without asking the, the huge Blender community to uh, register for an account. So it was Blender. Right. So probably a similar use case here. Okay, please go, go ahead. Awesome. Just, yeah, yeah, no, that. the Blender community is great. I love them. Um, so yeah, so anyway, so we do that and we'd get the feedback from the comments and then we do like a review meeting and go through the comments made it so easy because you just go comment by comment and you do the review and you talk things out and you iterate. So that was sort of how we did, I would say the most recent 
biggish project that we did with that tool that we kind of completed, right? So that was sort of the process we followed. One of the little niggles that I'll mention is that when we made the developer accounts, like, and I don't know if I'm using it wrong. I know that there's like, there's admin and editor roles right now. Yeah. And so when a developer goes in to check the mock-up, I think they can act, you know, like, I don't know, the cat jumping on the keyboard <laughs> or something, right? But stuff happens and it's sort of like me and my children and like, hey guys, I, I left my cupcake here and now it's gone, who ate it? It's that kind of situation, which is a little yeah. bit difficult at times. So that's why I try to limit who I give a cup uh, an account to. Um, the other thing is that it's actually quite handy when you log in and we have a project per, I didn't talk about this before, but we have a project per project in Penpot. So, you know, we give the developers access to whatever project that they're working on with us. Um, mm -hmm. When they go in and visit the file, I think it increments the timer. So it'll say like the file changed like an hour ago or something, even though it didn't change, it was just, they were looking at it. So then they think that the mock-up is updated when it's not, and I haven't touched it in a week. So okay. there's like little tiny niggles like that, that are like, what. but honestly, like on the whole, it's so much better than what we were doing, which was basically Inkscape with PNG exports in a Git repo using Sparkle Share, which is a nice setup, it really is, but it's a lot of manual work in terms of getting the files out there and, making sure that sparkle share is still working and making sure that the git repo permissions are correct they're just it, it eliminates all of that busy work so so that's sort of like the a process for that was the podman desktop project so for the fedora website the whole you know who took my cupcake problem is a little bit bigger because it's a a public community project so we basically anybody who's on the fedora websites team who asks, we give them access to the pen pot. I don't have it like an open thing, but if somebody is like, no, I'd like to help, I'll, I'll give them an account so they can pop in. But it, it gets to be a little bit like, um, we break it out into, so like I have a file and like another volunteer has a file. And we basically have this thing where we tell people like, if you wanna work on this and it, there's a pre-existing file, make a copy of the file and then mm -hmm. put it over here. And then one of the things that I might do is have them make like if there's a component like there's a piece of the file not a literal component but like a piece of the file that they updated that they'd like to update the design on the original i'll ask them to make it a component i'll add their file as a library in the original and then i'll pull oh, yeah. the component into that file so that's sort of it's a little bit kind of like a pull request in that you know your, your pr <laughs> is the component that you made and if i accept it then i add your file as a library and i pull the component into the design but um yeah i mean it's nice because even it, in Fedora as a public facing community, we have new folks come in all the time that are looking to contribute and they might be new to the Fedora project. Um, sometimes they're not new to say Fedora or they're not new to open source, but they're new to design and they're trying to switch fields. But in either case where there's like a lot of learning that has to go on and onboarding, they can log into the system, drop down which project they want to work on and then see like this whole visual list of everything that everybody else is working on. And it feels a lot more, I don't know, it, it, it feels, you can see everything people are working on and it, it feels more active than just people throwing Git repo URLs at you and then you log in to Git and you're like, I don't see the stuff, right? So it's, it's like a nice onboarding experience and the new onboarding flow that came out in a recent release has also been very helpful as well in, in terms of people new to Penpot. We we get volunteers who are used to Figma or they're used yeah. to Sketch and they've not yeah. used Penpot before. So having little things like that that pop up as they're starting their journey is really helpful. Yeah, that was, I think, release 1.16 um, or 1.15. Um, but it, it's we wanted to make sure before we do the official launch, we are still better. Um, but in the terms, in, in the sense of not being complete uh, at, at the level that we feel uh, like very proud of, uh, it will never be complete. Like that's that's not a thing for us. We know about that, but um, we wanted to make sure that we had a much better onboarding process before we even consider ourselves ready for the uh, general availability uh, of Penpot. So I'm glad that yeah, you know, people used to other tools like Sketch or Figma. Um, or Adobe XD, you know, there's the obvious competition, you know, the, the usual suspects are finding that onboarding experience to help them um, speed up, you know, their their process. Um, 
interesting that you mentioned, I mean, there are two things that you mentioned that are related to workflows. So I'm going to underscore those and tell you how I think we could approach them. One is the, yeah, the cupcake issue, right? Um, just people touching or moving things even slightly, just doing something and then undoing it. Uh, and then you have the update, uh, you know, file updated, with, but, but basically essentially the, the design remains the same, but it creates some confusion. So first I'll say that some of the people probably also from whether it was the Godot or the Oblivion community ask for a don't touch um, mode. Right. So just um, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't give editor uh, permissions to a developer, not at all, but that it would be easy for the developer or someone that is just uh, taking a look and just, you know, taking out some information, but not messing around to put some uh, mode like this. Don't touch or don't move or don't change. That's it. it you could actually uh, enjoy it yourself at some point, you know, like I just want to mess around um, knowing that there's no ch no changes are happening, right? So that's one thing that will be very helpful and give peace of mind, uh, you know, for people that uh, are fearful of making some mistakes, right? Um, so that's one. And the second is even if that you, you didn't need that, like you would, the fact that I just touch something or just click on some place, and Pempot is constantly updating that last updated, like it's very transactional, you know, a everything is a change. Well, perhaps it shouldn't be for some notification purposes. So broadcasting minor or you know, trivial changes as a, as a major file update or a project file update might not be a, a, the wisest of ideas, right? So we could have two levels of um, update notification and be very uh you know um yeah conscious of which ones deserve the honor of you know um having that broadcast uh you know effect on people uh so the two uh ideas combined i think would give uh, a lot of power and confidence to stakeholders that are not typically um you know like um it's not their to uh, the, the daily productivity tool, right? It's just they, they come on. But at the same time, I was interesting, you know, it was interesting to listen when you were saying like, it's nice to have all those projects there listed so that you can actually know, you know, you can know where people are, you know, when people are joining, you know, you see act, you see some activity. It feels that you are doing some, even if you're not synchronously, real time collaboration uh, is not happening. You can see, the warmth of, uh, you know, the, the content being um, consumed somehow, you know, or changed by someone. I think that's interesting for an open-faced, you know, very public-faced project like uh, Fedora. Yeah. That's yeah, right. and, and so it reminded me of what we used to do a lot with SparkleShare. And SparkleShare has, um, I don't, for anybody who doesn't know, SparkleShare is an open source GUI front end to get that makes it operate a little bit like Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that. But it had a thing. So if you had multiple designers working in the same repo, when you log in, it has like a change log. So you can see who last touched the file, what they did. Uh, it does auto commits. So there's no commit messages of any use there. But at least you could see, oh, you know, Madeline changed this file yesterday. Okay, let me take a look and see. And you can click and see. So it it's like that, but way nicer because you have the visuals to see, you know, who's working on what and how long ago they worked on it. So it's it's very nice. It's a, a nice way to acclimate when you're getting onboarded. Um, but should I, should I ask my next question? Because it's very yeah, yeah. what we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. What's the next question? So my next question was, you know, have you had any thoughts about some kind of Git integration or even Git like features? Like when you were talking about how maybe we don't do a big notification about it being a big design update when there was a minor change. I mean, it just makes me think, could we have something like a commit log and then be able to tag something like, oh, I've been screwing around with this file. It's not ready yet for the developers to really take a look at it, but maybe, you know, at a certain point I'm like, okay, let me tag this or, you know, something, but some kind of mechanism for um, being able to view the changes in the file and, being able to save milestones and things like that. Yeah, so I mean, short answer is absolutely. Uh, this is this is key for us. Um, we have this massive advantage because we're doing things the right way. Uh, 
uh, ethically and pragmatically, which is relying on open standards. So, you know, you know, our design, uh, your designs are basically a combination like 95% is SVG and then the remaining 5% is JSON, right? So there's a huge opportunity there to um, link everything on Pempo to a Git repository. But there are two ways, three, well, I'll just go for two obvious ways. One is that it, that is uh, the Git repo represents your storage level or layer, right? So it's just a matter of, um, persistence layer that's it i'm storing this Every, everything is connected so um i can link a project to a repo and or to a branch in that repo and i can just sort of select which files i want to see in pen pod you know or and if i make any changes th those are like no message commit push uh, actions that would be that would be fine and that is something like quite obvious um and allows designers to have almost first class citizenship in the repo, right? Because they're using their IDE, their equivalent to the ID, which is a design tool. But then I think what we want is to go beyond that and have all that workflow uh, within Pempot, like be able to tag, be able to branch out, be able to specifically commit push message. And that also linked to uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment um, triggers, right? So that you could say, okay, this is fine. I will uh, commit push in this branch or this, or I will rebase or something that as an abstraction makes sense for you as a designer. Like you don't have to go with a Git uh, command line, but Pempot is uh, making that abstraction uh, comfortable for you and that means something beyond the git repo it could actually go beyond the git repo and just put in production something just because you did uh, some action on Pempot, and um also the other way uh, around right that i think is th this is going to be big in 2023 so this is something we are looking at we haven't decided how exactly we're going to do this yet but this is like top priority if I earlier, earlier I mentioned how important performance is, that is in terms of the challenge, right? This this will be in terms of the opportunity, right? uh, like top one in terms of opportunity. Um, of course, you could forget all about Git and just um, make sure that you have similar concepts within Pempod for our design or, the, or for our designer, right? Just, I have this, I can tag this, I can say this, uh, you know, you can have version control within Pempot and have our own implementation of what version control for our design means without any connection to any Git repo. We want to have everything. So probably it's, we want to have the uh, within Pempot experience of version control, but, in, uh, but also inspired so much by the existing workflows that Git represents that once we develop the latter, we uh, we just um, surface uh, how that could actually be part of Pempot um, in general. Like, um, so there is, uh, we want to have that next year, and we have the uh, this feeling that if we do this right, if we make sure that one, you can have a version control feeling within Pempot so that different stakeholders understand what's finished, what is a milestone, what is uh, a, a particular version, what is draft, what is stable, what, whatever, right? Those concepts. And also as a designer, you decide, you know, specific checkpoints, you know, that you can go back and forth, that I can go back in history, right? Uh, do that. Plus that actually being able to use a Git repo as a backend. So all that can also uh, make sense at a Git repo level, a lot of developers are going to really enjoy um, uh, the Pempot workflow, really going to enjoy it because they're going to have a vocabulary they understand right there in a tool that they are not familiar with, but they suddenly care about, like, oh, you know, them. So, and of course, 
designers will need to tell us exactly how to implement this. Because after all, this is a design and prototype tool, right? We're not going to do this the way engineers would like it to be. Um, we're going to listen very carefully to, to what they prefer. But at the end of the day, this is a design and prototype tool. So uh, designers are going to tell us exactly how they can picture this uh, moving forward. So yeah, it's uh, 2023. If anything, for me personally, it's going to be to uh, go uh, and take this opportunity uh, because we're using open source and open standards. Yeah. Yeah, that's and that's the great opportunity you have, I think, because a lot of the other tools, I, I don't know, maybe I'm like going on a limb, but I kind of feel like their um, their entire model is based on locking your data in a specific cloud and then charging you a fee to access your data. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whereas because this is using open standards, open tooling, you can do something like have it backed by Git repo, which then maybe the developers don't want to use Penpot. Maybe they just want to have that Git repo connected somewhere else that they have a regular inbox of things coming in. And it it's just sort of the same data, but it's working in different ways for different people in the way that works best for their workflow. And you can do that, like it makes sense. Whereas if your model was based on basically selling cloud storage with an app on top, you couldn't. Yeah, I mean, the the so far, and you said you you entered this world at least uh, the Linux one uh, in the late in the late nineties, right? Late nineties did not have Git. We had Subversion and we have um, you know C, um, CVS, right? Yeah. Yep, CVS yeah. Subversion. Yeah, Subversion yeah. and that. Then we we uh, we had Mercurial and we had uh, you know a bunch of others. Everyone uh, came with their own um, flavor of distributed you know. Um, version control, but Git eventually uh, overruled. Um, and 20 years later, almost 20 years later, it is at the heart, at the center of the power, uh, power distribution in a project, right? The Git repo is like the single source of truth, you know, and but it's basically meant for code and for coders. So um, I'm not sure if we're going to, uh, perhaps tomorrow someone, um, you know, brings up something completely different and it's like, okay, now we have this other single source of truth that has a better, fairer, you know, power distribution across teammates. But right now the Git repo is disproportionately, uh, you know, uh, key. So let's, okay, let's, let's have that. Let's admit that how to be part of that seamlessly. Right. So I think that is, uh, and design is so much more important than ever, right? And the design, the design assets, the design workflow, everything. So uh, we're just trying to shortcut that, but it has to feel natural. So we'll probably make some mistakes along the way and have to go back and forth until we nail it. Like, okay, this is this is the perfect workflow now. This makes sense for everyone using the Git repo as it is, but also people interfacing that Git repo through a design and prototype tool. Uh, which will be mostly designers, right? Uh, perhaps in ten, you know, ten years, the next decade, uh, we'll see some other form of uh, repository that has a hybrid nature. But for now, we're going to try and give something to to teams. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, that that is big. So let me go for um, I think my last question, uh, and this is um, a bit more around yourself and your you know, your interaction, your experience with uh, open source design in general, you know, uh, your story and whether you are seeing, um, you, you know, anything you would like to highlight uh, about that experience and also things that you would, you're looking forward to seeing in the future. Um, it somehow, every time we have any discussions like this, like five years ago, 10 years ago, we think we are at the very close to a singularity event, right? It, we always think it's it's almost there. It doesn't seem different today, but um, but some things uh, feel even more um, changing, like more like, yeah, something big is happening. Um, and I would like to also hear, you know, your ideas or your hopes for the future of open source design. Sure. So um, when I was starting out early in my career, I was told by somebody who probably should have known better, 
um, open source and open practice of design, it's not really design thing. That's for kernel developers. That's not for designers. Designers can just design in their closed box and push it out. And, you know, it's up to kernel developers to do stuff in the open. I kind of thought that was BS. So <laughs> I kind of went and proved that it, it was. Um, I started with um, Warren Tagami in the early days, like 2005, the Fedora design team. And the idea, like, Basically, we needed a background wallpaper for the Fedora distribution every release. And I thought, well, I mean, the code is open source. Why don't we do open source art, right? Like, why don't we come up with a concept as a community and put together the artwork as a community and have that artwork be sort of a showcase? We, we basically used Fedora to create the wallpaper. So, you know, Blender on Fedora, Inkscape on Fedora, Gimp on Fedora, whatever. But it was sort of like this whole demonstrating what can be done with this system. And then every six months we do a release. So you'd have a new thing every six months. And, you know, there was a lot of bumps and oddities and stuff back then. Um, we didn't have video chat, really, like the way we do now. Um, it was hard to sort of, IRC was the primary communication, IRC and mailing lists. So like sending mockups and being able to get back and forth was a challenge. But over time, as the technology has gotten better, I can hop on a call with a colleague in India and we can have a shared screen and like work through issues in like 20 minutes the way we could in, you know, face to face in an office. So, you know, the technology has gotten to the point to enable this, but I really think like on the whole, we have a lot further to go in terms of, like you said, the, the power struggle with Git and commit access kind of being the arbiter. So designers are kind of left a little bit on the outside sometimes. Um, Early in my career, I, I mean, I have a background in computer science. I'm a terrible coder. You don't want me writing production code. But to prove a point, like I had an argument with some developer about the color of something. I didn't think it was enough contrast. And he was like arguing back and forth. And this was like Java code. I'm not a Java, but I figured out how to like put it together. And this was in subversion and I committed it. And then that sort of like won the argument. People didn't mess with me at that point but it's it okay. there is like this power thing where you have to understand how git works and you have to understand how to do commits in fedora one of our onboarding humps is you need an ssh key to create an account so i have explained what an ssh key is and how to make it probably a thousand times in my lifetime um but it's one of those things where i think where we need to go is Hey, I am. I would like to help make open source software better. I see you guys have a design team. I'd like to help out. What can I work on? And they log into a system like Penpat. They can see all of the projects that are being worked on, and they can just dive in. They don't need to create an SSH key. They don't need to learn how to use Git and open up a terminal and clone code and it, you know, like that stuff. It's just not important to a designer. So it would be nice to see sort of this shift. The other thing is that I think we're getting better in terms of like, there's a lot more designers in open source than there used to be. Um, yeah. There can always be more, but I would also like to see designers in open source working more upstream because I think right now, chances are if you're a designer who works in open source, you're working on code that is open source that's kind of taken downstream and productized and you're sort of adding on okay. you know, your okay. company's branding, maybe doing a little tweaks here and there. It's better to do the design up front rather than do it at the end when you're doing productization. So I would like to see the designers in the upstream communities right when features are getting developed that they're they're along for that ride too, rather than coming in on the end and sort of like yeah. painting. You know what I mean? And I, I see that all that like I, I will meet open source designers and they're stuck on this other end. The, the productization end is what I call it. So, but I think to be able to get to that where the designers are upstream and they're in the repos or whatever it will be in the future, um, that they're visible as upstream contributors and not just seen as sort of like corporate designers. I think to get there, the tooling and the workflows need to be more friendly to designers rather than this big wall of open up your terminal, fire up Git, get an SSH key and all the stuff I've already complained about. So that's, that's where I'd like to see things go. And I would like to see it also that I, you know, it's sort of a thing where people who have a different skill set that are interested in open source can learn design and people who are designers and don't know anything about open source can learn open source. And it's sort of just this open commons of ideas. So, 
So you uh, you said something um, I think absolutely key here, which is the the, the you know designers interested um, committed to contribute to some open source projects should first consider okay go upstream right otherwise you're going to contribute but it's going to contribute um just a very specific implementation or productivity you know productification of something and um it that's very tough to revert back upstream once it's part of uh, some branding effort right exactly i can picture many many examples of that so it's not just that it's um, a bit of waste, perhaps, but also the level of engagement um, for designers in open source would be at best like half of what what it could be, right? It, it would be down down the line too much. So my my comment is totally agree with that, and probably what is going to happen is that the open source projects that at the upstream level are capable of attracting you know those designers in the first place to understanding their needs whether it's tooling or workflows or just respect right um are going to have uh, much more success in 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 just flourishing in terms of of design and um so what i'm saying is that of course designers have to think about that but i will also um tell open source maintainers and, and you know core teams uh, be sure to be welcoming because um, the uh, the risk that you you have is just saying I don't care about this and then designers just say okay upstream is is blocked I'll continue to do this in a way that you actually don't like don't really enjoy so much so I would rather see uh, those core teams which are very code centric you know, uh, gate centric, etc., opening up their workflows to welcome designers at that level. Uh, that would be that would be great. So it's a two two you know a mixed effort. So uh, uh, it's, it's a complex strategy, but it should work. But it's an interesting conversation um, to have. And the other All thing right. with design contributions is they tend, if especially if it's like a UX interaction yeah. design, it tends to be really deep. Right. So you want to attract somebody for the long haul. You don't want somebody coming in and doing a drive by UX yeah. engagement with your upstream because, you know, they don't you need to get very deep. But there's surface level things that a designer can do, too. So part of it is also enabling both like you just want, you know, a graphic or a logo. Right. That's yeah. a relatively small scope versus we want to overhaul this new feature. Um, you need to recruit people at both levels. Too. So you need to be able to have that long-term relationship with a designer who understands the tech pretty far down, who can help make calls that make sense that you couldn't do at a surface level. I think uh, that is uh, also related to uh, this, this not power struggle uh, or related to that, which is, so a, a tip here, a pro tip here for uh, traditional, let's say, backend developers or full stack developers that come from the backend world would be see UX uh, designers as backend in the sense that um, there has been a um, transposition or there has been some uh, um, offering of part of the decision making process, you know, and power that comes with it from the backend layers from the, the you know, information architecture at the backend level to the UX, right? More and more you see UX people um, making decisions that traditionally in the past would be made by people just running the database, right? And so my comment here would be the same way you treat potential contributors to the backend, to the, you know, those deep layers of database and, and domain expertise and, you know, even though now you have backend at the front end level too, you know, it just gets uh, complicated. That is a very long, uh, you know, for the long run, it is a, it's, it's about sustainability. So exactly your point. If you're going to, you want to attract UX people it, as a shortcut, a mental shortcut, treat them as you would have treated in the past, like core backend contributors, right? Don't treat them as they can do just one or two things here. And because they need 
you need commitment for the long term so that the benefits are really significant. That doesn't mean that uh, other people or even those UX uh, contributors can do, uh, you know, things that are more isolated and self-contained that are interesting contributors as, you know, themselves. But uh, the interaction um, uh, experience, for me personally, it reminds me of the uh, the long term vision of a database design, you know, a model design, um, and, and all that. So, um, so yeah, that that could be like a way to translate the importance of really welcoming those for the for the long term. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have. Uh, time for one more question uh, from your side, and then I think we'll we'll wrap up. Sure. So yeah. So I guess the question I had was basically, are there good resources or like what is the, how should we be using the component feature? Because it's something kind of new to us coming from Inkscape. Um, we've noticed some. I don't know. It, it could be just using it wrong, kind of thing. So I'm not sure. Like like for example, I gave you the the scenario where we're using it to transfer items between files. Um, I mean, that that seems like probably a way you're, you should be using it, but um, in terms of like the larger context of a design system, you know, yeah. what, what was the vision there and how should we be using it? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, let me start by saying that the component um, system in PenPod is rapidly evolving. And, we have something that is working right now, uh, particularly for people that are, have been used, you know, having exposed to similar, um, you know, metaphors or abstractions in the past. So if you're coming from, let's say, Inkscape, where you don't have that, then it's completely new, and you would actually go through the same learning curve as people now familiar with existing component um, uh, systems in other tools. Right? It takes. It actually is borrowing ideas of. Um, engineering. It's basically uh, borrowing ideas about um, having one single source of truth and then the variance and then, you know, uh, kind of a child element uh, reflect its changes back to uh, to the parent one. And if so, would that reflect on the rest of the child notes or not? Should, be, should you be asked permission to do that? You know, uh, all that stuff. So I think um, we are it's under heavy development right now, and it's going to be part of the upcoming official um, launch in in some point in you know the next few weeks. So it you know you do not have to wait much. But it this is um, the 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 basic concept here is that we are going to migrate from a virtual component or you know parent component that doesn't have a physical representation within PenPod, right? This is right now what we are doing. What we have now is that there is no physical representation. I mean, I hope you, people understand, like, of course, no physical, but there's no obvious place where a uh, parent component or the component is. Uh, everything could be a component, uh, a parent component everywhere where any child lives, right? And so we are migrating from math, math metaphor to um, an, an easier one or a simpler one which is yeah there is this um, parent component here and you can just connect any child component elsewhere to that that plus a easier representation and and symbolism uh, at the layer uh, level layer should be able to um, help you in understanding you know the, the endless possibilities because this is obviously one of the um, most potent um, features and benefits that we, we have, borrowing ideas from the engineering world. So we are bringing all that power and flexibility to a designer, and uh, but we do expect a learning curve. So we do expect people saying, I don't understand this. So we have our tutorials, we will have, you know, um, you know, like, hands-on design examples, a, um, of course, libraries and templates that showcase that. We will make sure everyone that wants 
just to experience that, even if it's at surface level, will have a ton of content to rely on. Because that is, for us, part of the critical path to scaling design up, to make sure that you can actually scale up your design as much as you want, uh, thanks to componentization, to making everything be a variable, to track, you know, um, where you have to change in order for the, you know the ripple effect to happen right so this is uh, similar to what i was saying before about the gate repo and the gate metaphor the advanced components um system and just in, in a few weeks will make sure that everything people have been using so far is perfectly valid will just go to the next level right so um but yeah uh we can we could provide rather soon some tutorial um you can actually try it out if you go to um i'll, I'll share you a private link <laughs> so you can go to the experiment release you know uh server where you can actually try out what's coming next but we can the same way we showcased um the um the flex layout uh feature which is not public yet, but you can actually try it out. If you go to the repo and just uh, deploy what's recent, we will do the same with uh, design, um, the components, uh, advanced components, uh, to make sure that you have an easy path um, onboarding that feature. But yeah, think a bit uh, about just the simplest way to uh, encapsulate shared variables in a place and then have an easy way of finding where any incarnation of that component is placed you know and that that relationship um all right well thank you uh morning very much for uh being part of this um little experiment of ours that we're going to um share this you know as soon as possible for the whole pempot community and hopefully for all the communities that intersect with ours and um, if you'd like to say anything before we, uh, you know, we finish this, um, glad to hear your words, of course. Yeah. Uh, no, I just this has been exciting. Thanks. I'm I'm really excited to hear about the advanced component stuff too, because like I said, it's sort of new to us. So like having built design systems from scratch, yeah. bit by bit, it sounds like it'll make putting together a design system much easier and almost self-documenting. So very very much looking forward to that. I would love to see the preview link. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much, uh, everyone uh, that joined this um, podcast. Um, and we'll just continue to have this every every month, more or less, I think. And um, and please, you know, send any feedback, comments, questions that you would like us to answer or perhaps ideas uh, for people to join as as, as guests. Uh, that would be great. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>